If a world-ending monster destroyed your entire family and you had decades to plot your perfect revenge, what would you do? The entire human race has been kicked out of Earth and killing this beast is our species' last chance. So I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the giant atomic lizard in Godzilla Planet of the Monsters. This young man has been waiting 22 years for revenge, but he's going to get way more than he bargained for. Haruo here is about to become the leader of the entire human race who has to kill a lizard monster the size of a mountain. One very, very bad day. Near the end of the 20th century, giant monsters called kaiju rose from the depths of the earth and overran the world. They absolutely devastated the planet, destroying civilization and killing millions of people. The biggest and worst of these monsters was called Godzilla. But I must say though, this big boy lizard must like his garlic anchovy dip because holy halitosis, he has the most catastrophic atomic breath that you have ever seen. It can mow down an entire city in a matter of seconds. During the long war against these monsters, two alien races made contact with humans, both offering to help fight. But it was no use. Nothing could hurt Godzilla. He even is able to survive a full-on nuclear blast completely unscathed. And with no other choice left, the remains of the human race decided to flee the planet into space with the remaining aliens. And this boy, Haruo, is among the humans rushing to board the escaped craft as Godzilla prowls through their city. In the realm of epic battles and heart-pounding action, behold the mighty War Thunder, an awe-inspiring free-to-play multiplayer game that immerses you in the exhilarating world of top military warfare. Just like the heroes of today's anime saga, you embark on an adrenaline-fueled quest, showcasing your strategic prowess and unleashing devastating firepower upon your adversaries. Available on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, War Thunder transports you to a realm where legendary war machines clash and the fate of nations hangs in the balance. Maps look realistic and span all the way from Africa to Alaska. Choose your path, whether you're a valiant tank commander, an intrepid pilot soaring through the skies, or a cunning captain steering a formidable warship. War Thunder includes vehicles from 10 nations, USSR, USA, Germany, and others, each with their own unique vehicle skins. And War Thunder even features a real anime skin on the Japanese AH-1S helicopter. Sarazu in use with the JSDF. Channel your inner hero as you strive for victory in epic battles that echo the dramatic showdowns of your favorite anime series. And if you get scared on the battlefield, Dakimakuru pillows have been added into the game. Hug them during battles if you need a little more moral support. So gather your strength, embrace the call of destiny, and venture forth to seize your place among the legends. Download War Thunder today and claim your Dakimakuru pillow and other glorious bonuses from the link in the description. Overcome with worry, Haruo calls out for his parents and finds out that they're on their way. In fact, he can even see their buses approaching in the distance, and nearby two shuttles take off in hopes of escaping this doomed planet once and for all. But this pisses off Godzilla, who blasts them with his atomic breath. The massive fireball overturns and consumes the buses too, killing Haruo's parents. And the boy can only watch and cry helplessly in the distance as he is pulled towards safety. Fast forward 22 years later, or just around the same time it takes for my pizza to arrive on a Friday night, Haruo is now a captain aboard humanity's last spaceship, and only 4,000 people remain, along with a handful of their alien friends, and their resources are dwindling fast. They've never managed to find another planet compatible with life over the past two decades, and are now floating aimlessly through space. The ship's elderly residents, including Haruo's adoptive grandfather, volunteer to travel to a nearby planet to scout it out. This worries the young man a lot. He is convinced that the mission is doomed from the start, and that the central government is just trying to send the seniors to their deaths in order to keep more resources for themselves. Refusing to let them die, the young captain locks himself in the landing pod with explosives. He threatens to blow the pod up if the government doesn't let the seniors stay. And just then, a transmission comes in for Haruo. It is his grandfather. The old man tells him that no one is forcing the seniors to do anything. They have grown weary of being trapped on the ship and with nowhere to go and are willingly taking a risk to help everyone else. Haruo's grandfather reassures him that this is his choice, leaving the young man stunned. Others infiltrate the pod and arrest him, placing a pair of magnetic handcuffs on him. 
the human race pretty much got themselves into this dystopian hell of an exile with the new threat of giant monsters. They tried to fight back in the worst way possible, then they opted to flee the earth entirely as a backup plan. If I was a world leader back then, I would insist that nobody from my army sends themselves to their deaths against this monster until we understand where it came from and how it works. Godzilla shares many features with reptiles that we know. He has scales all over his body, a backbone, and tail if we can study his behavior and characteristics further. We could determine if he is cold-blooded like a reptile too, and being cold-blooded means that this creature's body temperature can vary drastically depending on their environment. And because of this, cold-blooded animals have a very clear weakness. They're greatly slowed or even immobilized when immersed in a cold environment. Putting them in a cold spot causes them to go into shock as their body temperature plummets. And this state is called torpidity, and it is defined as the reptile experiencing severely dulled senses and having their physical and mental activity drop to near zero. And this could be the exact weakness that we can exploit to put an end to this death lizard once and for all. In Japan, December to February is winter, with January being the coldest month where temperatures tend to drop to 35 degrees. The residents of the city can flee to the outskirts of the country and hide out for a few months while we wait for winter. We can get our Steve Irwin on from a distance and observe Godzilla during the winter and see if he does get slower in his movements or exhibits any other sign of torpidity. Once the cold weather really sets in, we can spring into action. Japan's fire department has a fleet of firefighting helicopters, which can store water in its belly tank and transport it great distances to dump over forest fires. If we fill up all of our helicopters and fire trucks with cold water from the nearby lakes and oceans and wait for the coldest day of the year, we will try to dump as much freezing water as possible onto Godzilla's skin and force him to go into a state of shock. This is very easily fatal for regular reptiles, but it is likely that Godzilla will not be killed so easily. The special forces should then continue dumping cold water on him so he will continue to be paralyzed and not able to attack back or activate his freaking annoying shield. That's when we will have the most heavy duty military weaponry that can be used to target the weak spots along his body. The military can then attempt to pump tons of cement down his nostrils and mouth in an attempt to suffocate the massive lizard. These tactics may or may not work, but they're certainly a heck of a lot smarter than just charging in to fight an unkillable monster when he is invincible and even more likely invincible in warmer weather. Haru always thrown into a locked room in the bowels of the ship. The landing pod leaves the dock and jets away from the ship. The government has cleared the pod of the explosives and the seniors have boarded it to leave the ship. The young man watches as all the seniors, including his grandfather, load away through space. Suddenly to his absolute horror, the entire pod blows up and kills everyone on board. Sometime later, Haruo is visited by the alien Metfis, a colonel and religious leader aboard the ship. The pale alien passes him a drive containing valuable information Haruo has previously found. It is a plan that the young man had been working on for some time, studying Godzilla's weaknesses and speculating on a way to possibly kill him. As Haruo looks through it, he reflects on how dire the situation they are now in, thinking it's all Godzilla fault and remembers how the monster took everything away from them. He thinks they gave up way too easily and should have stayed on Earth and continued to fight Godzilla and eventually find a way to kill him. Metfiz disagrees though, but the captain says they just need the right tactics. Haruo is resolved to show everyone that Godzilla can be killed and he gives the drive back to Metfiz. The next day, Haruo's research and plan has been published to the entire ship. The ship's residents start to talk among themselves and spread rumors about the plan. The ship's crew discuss their options. They point out that the chances of finding another habitable planet is less than 1%. Their resources are also running out quickly, so much so that even if they skimp out on comfort and make conditions super miserable, they figured out they will run out of supplies in 8 years. On the other hand, they noticed that reactions to the published plan to kill Godzilla are cautiously optimistic. The crew also agrees that, while it is a huge risk, it is technically possible to return to Earth and try to face down the beast again. Metfis privately meets with the ship's technical officer, who is another alien from a different species. The officer's name is Muluelu Galu... But I, I'm not gonna bother because I, I can't. Moving on, they openly talk about knowing how Haruo is the author of the plan and Metfiz was the one who published it onto the ship's server. The officer is not as confident. He thinks that even if they tried it against Godzilla back in the day, they all would have died anyways. Both aliens express suspicions about each other's motives and the officer claims Metfiz's original plan in the beginning was to indoctrinate humans with his religion, while Metfiz claims that the officer's species would have turned against the humans next if they had beaten Godzilla with their mecha. Godzilla. But they both all agree that it's all daydreams and fairy tales now. The aliens admit that because of Godzilla, they're in the same sinking ship as their human prey at the moment.
This is exactly why we can't have nice things. Everyone here has their own agenda, and it was downright naive for Haruo or the human race to ever assume that they're the center of the universe and that other human species are motivated to help mankind out of the kindness of their hearts. If I were Haruo, I would be very suspicious of why Metfees is so eager to help me. What is it about his religion that he thinks I could help him out so much? This religious alien sure loves to make weird gestures and touch my shoulders in a rather tender way, but Metfees has said himself that he doesn't believe any species have the capability to beat Godzilla. Hence, it doesn't make sense why he would publish my Godzilla kill plan and help win support to travel back to Earth. And if we really think about it, if we ignore his strange mannerisms and look exactly at what he was actually saying when passing the information drive, the alien doesn't express any sympathy for our cause or motivation to help the human race. He does not even match Haruo's passionate energy or offer comfort when the young man pours his heart out about how bitter and broken he is because of Godzilla's destruction. Something is going on beneath the surface with this alien, and it all suggests that Metfees is acting with an ulterior motive. His species first came to Earth just after Godzilla attacked. Unlike the technical officer species, who clearly explained their planet had been destroyed by the monsters and had come to Earth to offer help, Metfees' species was a lot more evasive about their plans. They claimed to be observers and predictors, visiting to offer sage-like advice and guide mankind's destiny in a great time of need. They did not seem too concerned concerned about Godzilla at all, and instead urged all humans to convert to their religion. He did not even focus on offering to help against the Death Lizard, and literally pushed the human race to extinction, and only seemed concerned about his religious message. This shows that Metfees has an established pattern of trying to capitalize on moments of tragedy to recruit more followers to his side. Haruo needs to be very wary of his supposed friend and what he's trying to do, and why he's here again. By pretending to support his plan and then broadcast it to the entire ship before Haruo was fully ready, the alien might be setting them all up for failure. If they confront Godzilla before they are ready and another big tragedy happens and there are many more people that died, I'd hate to think it, but that just might be what Metfees is planning for. After talking it over, the ship's government decides to execute Haruo's plan of returning to Earth and trying to kill Godzilla. They activate the ship's full power and travel at hyperspeed, zooming light years through space and arriving at Earth. The residents immediately rush to the window, staring at the planet's surface in awe and marveling at how blue it looks. For some of the younger ones, this may be the very first time they are seeing their home planet. While everyone is relieved that the jump through space was successful, there are still so many unknowns due to time dilation. The crew knows time passes differently on Earth compared to that on the ship, and they're unsure how much time has passed on Earth while they were adrift for space for 22 years. They estimate that it possibly may be thousands of years. Determined to find out more, as well as to study the conditions of Earth now, they deploy many drones into the planet's atmosphere. And when the readings come in, everyone is stunned to learn that 10,000 years have gone by on Earth since the last time they were even there. The planet's ecosystem has also completely changed. The drones detect heavy electromagnetic interference, and the cameras pick up a thick fog full of floating particles throughout the air. And out of nowhere, a massive spike in energy and temperature is detected by one of the drones before it loses signal entirely. The readings suggest that it is the atomic breath, and a terrifying roar is heard through the drone's speakers, and it's confirmed. Godzilla is still still alive, the 10,000 years has done nothing to diminish his power or, well, shall we say, his foul mood. With their worst fear realized, the crew flies into a panic and discuss their hopeless oh woe is me situation. What if they're imagining everything and the roar was just thunder? What if he's just completely immortal? Godzilla doesn't already make sense. From a scientific perspective, the monster may just be unkillable for no reason. This professor though speaks up that there has to be a logical reason that Godzilla isn't dead, suggesting that he may be surviving by going through cycles similar to hibernation. The crew also wonders if things have gotten far worse, and dare they say it, Godzilla may even have reproduced. But they convince themselves that the monster is one of a kind, and another like him would never surely emerge. Their focus then turns back to the published plan to kill Godzilla and its mystery author. They agree that this plan is their only option. The others press Metfees to reveal the author, so they can fully put the plan into action, but he insists that he will only reveal the author if Haruo is released, and all charges against him are dropped with their backs against the wall. The crew reluctantly agrees. The young captain is brought up from his cell and is recognized as the plan's author and expert on how to kill Godzilla. He finally has the opportunity to address the ship's main crew and explains the full extent of his master plan.
Okay, these people should really learn to cut their losses. There were two main reasons why they chose to take a chance to returning to Earth. Number one, Earth used to be habitable and the crew was not going to find another suitable planet after 22 years searching in space. Number two, they were placing blind faith in the fact that Godzilla would have died of old age by now. Both of these things have now been clearly proven false and there's absolutely no reason why they should stick with a plan that no longer makes sense. Everything about the Earth has changed. If the Earth's atmosphere is filled with unknown fog now, and it's no longer breathable to humans, they have no clear plan as to how they're going to survive on Earth, even if they manage the impossible and somehow kill Godzilla. With the Earth now covered in a permanent haze which blocks out most sunlight and no longer guarantees that there is even any water or carbon dioxide left, the survivors will now be forced to survive on depleting rations that they already have with them with no guaranteed sustainable food source on Earth. The crew might as well have taken their chances on Mars or the Moon or any other planet that doesn't have a world-ending death lizard. I mean, at the very least, they should make the reconnaissance a stealth mission instead of announcing their arrival with dozens of drones. Godzilla has likely grown complacent from 10,000 years of peace, so maybe sending foreign objects like drones is the worst mistake that they could have made, because all humans on Earth have died over the thousands of years. International boundaries do not exist anymore. The crew should have avoided Japan entirely and find a spot that will not, in fact, cause a nuclear war. Seeing as Godzilla has stayed in Japan for 10,000 years, it is doubtful he will ever travel anywhere else. If the ship performs a covert landing on the other side of the world, the giant lizard may never even know humans have returned and might just leave us alone, which buys us decades of time to learn about the planet's new environment and repopulate and establish a strong civilization, and then when they've fully grown into a formidable military presence, then they should have attempted to go to war with the monster again. Haruo starts presenting his plan by explaining that Godzilla isn't just naturally invincible, he is actually protected by an electromagnetic shield that can turn on and off when he senses danger. The captain is also convinced that, just like how each of our organs have a specialized function, a particular organ must be the power center of his shield. He says that they need to trick Godzilla into activating the shield so they can study which part of his body it is actually coming from and identify the organ controlling the monster's chief defensive measure. Haruo then explains what he has found out about the sound wavelengths Godzilla produces. The shield has a distinct sound when it activates, and this will be the key to taking it down. If they can use sound wave analysis to identify the origin of the shield, they can learn the shield's patterns and attack Godzilla while his shield is recharging. Haruo wants to target the shield producing organ first, destroy it, and remove the monster's ability to turn invincible. They would then have to fire an EMP probe into Godzilla's body and detonate it. Given the monster's electromagnetic properties, the captain is convinced that this will be enough to kill him. The strike force will need to move quickly though, because Godzilla has superhuman regenerative abilities. Any damage inflicted to the organ will be repaired in a matter of seconds and the shield will turn back on. They only have one shot at this and have a really absolutely tiny window of time to make their killing shot with the EMP probe. With everyone all gung-ho and caught up, Haruo asks for 600 soldiers to execute this plan. The soldiers split themselves into groups of four. They descend to Earth on different landing pods. Three of the groups go to a mountain pass to set things up, intending to lure and trap Godzilla there. And Haruo is on the final ship, which plans to land some distance away. And before it can land, the ship drops carpet bombs to clear the forest below and make a landing zone. Haruo's team finds that the atmosphere may not be breathable and that the electromagnetic fog will make communication with the other teams very difficult. They decide to step out and explore what the Earth has become. This sergeant, Yuko, is assigned to be Haruo's handler for this expedition since he is still considered a criminal out on bail for his antics with the seniors pod. This Yuko happens to be Haruo's childhood friend whose grandfather adopted the young man after his parents died. Yuko says that she is suspicious of the government and their central committee. She tells Haruo that they claim to have removed all the bombs from the pod before letting the seniors on, yet it blew up anyway in a freak accident, which seems to confirm the young man's theory that they're just trying to get rid of the outers to free up resources for themselves. Haruo agrees that he doesn't trust them either, but cannot bring himself to believe that his own government would do something so freaking evil. There are now 600 lives at stake with this plan here. It may not seem like a lot, but given what humanity has dwindled down to, 600 people represent 15% of the total surviving population. And these are young, fit soldiers at the prime of their youth. In the interest of survival of the human species, every life is precious. In fact, studies have shown that an absolute minimum of 500 people will be needed to repopulate. This will ensure that future generations, enough genetic diversity to not develop crippling illnesses and avoid inbreeding, which will then cause our species to inevitably 
eventually go extinct. This means that Haruo really needs to think long and hard before he deploys any of his valuable soldiers to risk their lives on Earth. Each one of his soldiers isn't just valuable on the battlefield, they're sweet resources to have in the bedroom when it comes time to repopulate the Earth. The crew said that they have 8 years of supplies left, at the very least. They could have at least sent some more drones to survey the situation on the planet before sending actual people in. What the drones can do is to help scan for other life forms apart from Godzilla, find out whether they are not hostile, and whether there are other hazards that have developed on the planet in the past 10,000 years, and if there's any geological changes or features that they can use against this giant lizard when they land. There is no sense in trying to make this mission a matter of brute force when they're up against a giant death lizard with several trillion tons of brute force and a freaking giant laser mouth. They should instead treat Godzilla like an invasive species and manipulate the ecosystem around him to try and kill him. This way, there's less lives that need to be risked and only burn through the amount of human life that is absolutely necessary. Since Godzilla now lives in the mountains, the crew could poison the most likely sources of water he drinks from and wait to see if the monster succumbs to the toxins. Godzilla also needs to get his energy from somewhere, and this means that there are likely many smaller creatures on Earth which Godzilla eats for sustenance. If a small crew of sneaky soldiers can land on Earth without Godzilla noticing, they could salt massive areas of Godzilla's habitat with the aim of killing off as much of the plant life as possible. This means that the smaller creatures will no longer have food and die out and cause Godzilla's own food source to be cut off after several months. The last and most fun way that I've figured out that the crew could attempt to kill Godzilla from afar is to cause a natural disaster on Earth. Japan is surrounded by massive bodies of water, and their ship has a ton of fancy weaponry and firepower. If a big enough nuclear warhead can be fired into the surrounding ocean, this might cause a tsunami to engulf the mountains and submerge Godzilla, which could mean death for the monster if this version of Godzilla cannot swim. In the forest, the crew discovers something very strange about the vegetation. The professor strikes a leaf with a blade, and the blade instantly breaks. The older man tells everyone not to touch them. These plants are all made of razor-sharp metal. None of the crew can afford to tear their suits, because they might suffocate the new strange atmosphere. Going further in, Haruo sees that vines and plants have kept the same shape of buildings within the city, even though the city is long gone. And he breaks down crying, feeling moved that the earth has remembered humanity. The young man feels that this is home and where they should belong. Back at the main landing pod, flying metallic monsters suddenly burst out of the forest and attack the crew. The soldiers fight back, bullets seeming to hurt them, and quite a few monsters are shot out of the sky. But there are way too many and they keep coming. Haruo's group hears the commotion and rushes back to help. By the time they reach the pod, the monsters are gone. But the destruction they've caused is extensive. They analyze one of the monster's bodies and finds that it exhibits magnetic properties, same as the plants on this planet, and same as Godzilla himself. The giant lizard has spread its genetic properties to the ecosystem of the entire planet over the past thousands of years. The crew realizes that the electromagnetic interference of the fog isn't part of the weather. It's actually pollen from the vegetation all around them, and there is no longer any sense for the crew to wait for it to clear, because it never will. The ranking officer, Colonel Leland, decides to abort the plan to kill Godzilla, and Haruo is furious. He attacks the colonel and accuses him of giving up. The captain insists that the Earth is their home, but his superiors won't budge. The older man wants to explore relocating to the moon, and only make covert trips to the Earth now and time again to gather resources, and they prepare to return to the mother ship, but they find that all the ships capable of flying back into space have been destroyed. Their crew will now have to travel to the mountain pass and meet up with the other three groups in order to repair their ships and leave the planet. The crew then heads out and attempt to travel silently towards the mountain pass. The colonel is furious since this course of action is identical to Haruo's original plan to travel there and kill Godzilla. He insists that he has no intention to draw the monster out, but Godzilla notices them right freaking away, and they scramble and try to change course, but it's too late. Knowing that things are about to get rough, Matt Fees frees Haruo from his handcuffs and tells him to do as he pleases. Gee, thanks, Metfees. Now there's clearly confirmation that there are other aggressive creatures on the planet, and because of that, the plan of attack needs to change. When taking a sample of their skin, the professor here discovers that they are made from some form of metal with electromagnetic resonance, and it's very similar to Godzilla's scales. Haruo will need to tell the soldiers on Earth to retreat for now and return to the lab on board the main ship. He will need to give the professor and other scientists time to further study the bodies of the creatures that they have killed, and these studies will help determine if there are any modifications the soldiers 
can make to their weapons that will make them more effective against Godzilla's scales. We can have weapon specialists also experiment with the creature's metallic skin. They could try to belt it down, mold it into different shapes of weapons, test how hard, elastic, or brittle it is. The electromagnetic property of the metal is also a big mystery too, but by studying it over several weeks as well, the crew can improve their plan by tweaking the EMP probes that they have that are meant to kill Godzilla and make them to be more effective against the specific electromagnetic readings that were given off by the creatures invading Earth. Because if the crew can recall, Godzilla wasn't the only creature to rise out of the Earth's depths. They need to stay alert for these other monsters as well. For all anyone knows, something even worse than Godzilla may be lurking on the Earth awaiting its next prey. If I were in Haruo's shoes, I would order any drone or any other reconnaissance robot that we have to try and enter the Earth's depths and go to where the monsters came from. By doing this, we may discover a central nest of these monsters and be able to observe any form of hierarchy or social structure they may have. See their behavior. We might be able to find out what catches their interest and what pisses them off then. Using this information, we can then try to pit the monsters against each other so they will kill each other off as much as possible before we attack. It's a win-win, but to do that, we have to go looking for them. In trying to evade Godzilla too quickly, the ship overcorrects and starts plummeting, crashing into the surrounding trees. The screens light up bright red, warning the crew that it will explode at any moment. Seeing this, everyone gets down and flees into the jungle. Haruo is last to leave, and instead of joining the other soldiers, Soldiers, he gets on a hover bike and blasts off from the ship just as it explodes. Yuko and the crew watch in shock as he recklessly charges at Godzilla on the bike. The professor realizes that the young man is just trying to carry out their original plan. Haruo intends to force Godzilla to activate its shield so the crew can identify which organ it is coming from, and Haruo gets right in front of the monster's face and fires dozens of bullets at it point blank rage. And Godzilla barely even notices, ignoring them like gnats, and doesn't even activate his shield. He charges in again, fully prepared to sacrifice himself by crashing the bike into Godzilla. But just before he can do it, the colonel bombards the monster with heavier bullets from a mech suit, which finally gets Godzilla's attention. He activates his shield and kills the colonel on the spot, leaving Haruo stunned. Making the most of the colonel's sacrifice, the crew analyzes Godzilla's shield pattern and finding out that Haruo was right. The shield is uneven and is only activated periodically by a central organ, the monster's dorsal fin. With the colonel dead, Betfiz inherits the title of commander of the soldiers left on Earth, and the alien is very spiritual and once again gives a speech about trusting in his religion while honoring the colonel and then he finally declares that as the new commander, he will be delegating all authority to Haruo. The young captain accepts, and he steps onto the platform and urges the soldiers to fight on, rallying them to stay on their home planet and at least try to reclaim some of humanity's former happiness or die trying. He says that he will lead them in the do or die effort to end Godzilla once and for all, and after his speech, Haruo discusses his plans with a few ranking officers. They will need to try and lure Godzilla into the mountain pass, where their comrades have already set up a trap. Okay, good, I'm thrilled that his plan has somehow worked so far, but he really should have applied some of those smart tactics and in his instructions to the hover bike squad. There are only around 20 bikes and soldiers who know how to ride them in total, and their objective is to lure Godzilla, who walks very slowly to the mountain pass. What happens if they run out of bullets or fuel, or if Godzilla destroys all the bikes and kills them all? This squad never intended to hurt Godzilla anyways. There is no reason that they should all charge at once and only waste their limited resources. The core of the plan remains the same. Attack the giant lizard one at a time in continuous waves and in doing so they can still ensure that he is constantly pissed off into following them all the way to the mountain pass. They'll save more fuel and this is a better scenario, but an even better one would be to modify the weapons and have them mounted to the back of the hover bikes and make them capable of firing backwards as the bikes travel through the air. Then the squad can plan for having just one bike in front of the monster at any given moment, shooting at it and grabbing his attention while riding away. And the rest of the bike squad needs to be really careful and should be trailing the action in a single file formation behind and above Godzilla, well out of his field of vision and the line of fire. Once the bike taking the heat needs to reload and refuel or the next bike in line can simply swap in and all the next soldier needs to do is speed up a little, drop the altitude a little bit and cause their bike to descend right in front of Godzilla and into his vision. Doing this will greatly reduce the risk associated with this plan of attack since this means that the bikes will only need to travel in a straight line and the one under attack can always be moving away from Godzilla instead of charging up to him. Each soldier's entire focus can now be devoted to evading his attacks rather than having to 
to worry about maneuvering around their fellow squad members or having to circle around and in and out and charging up to Godzilla repeatedly. The hover bike attacks provoke Godzilla. With each wave of charges made up by the soldiers, the monster attacks and kills more and more of them. And to make things worse, the flying reptiles also reemerge and attack the hover bikes, causing even more casualties. With Godzilla and his creatures killing soldiers left and right, more than half of the hover bike squad is wiped out after a few minutes. But nonetheless, the plan is working. Slowly but surely, Godzilla is chasing them back towards the mountain pass. The hover bikes are quickly running low on fuel and bullets. So Haruo makes a big man main character call, his lieutenant to fall back by himself, and instead pilot the landing ship to carry out a special mission. Acting quickly, the lieutenant complies. His mission is to deploy the larger ship's carpet bombs to cut a path right through the heavy vegetation so Godzilla can get to the mountain pass before the hover bike team perishes entirely. And the man succeeds, sending heavy explosions rippling through the forest right in front of Godzilla, but something is wrong. The man senses the danger and reacts just in time, ejecting from the ship as the lizard blasts it into a million pieces. Thanks to the lieutenant though, the hoverbike squad now has a much easier time of drawing Godzilla towards the mountain pass. And after a few more rounds of fierce attacks, the monster reaches the target destination. As Godzilla reaches the narrow mountain pass, surrounded on both sides by tall ridges, Haruo gives the command. Explosions ring out all around him, blasting the mountain apart. The massive debris crashes down onto the monster, covering most of his body and pinning him in place. The giant lizard roars fiercely, but cannot move or free himself. On the other side of the mountain pass, the soldiers blast him with heavy fire from the ground in a synchronized attack, and the monster is forced to activate his shield to block the unending stream of attacks. This is all a part of Haruo's plan, and the tactical team is able to analyze the wave patterns given off by the shield, and they apply Haruo's finding and detect when the shield will go down, and they need to hold out for 20 more seconds, and the shield will turn off. Okay folks, instead of continuing to fire at his torso, Haruo should order at least 70% of his men to ensure that the monster stays trapped under the rubble. The soldiers operating their artillery guns or surviving hover bikes can focus on blasting more fragments of the mountain ridges around him loose so that even more heavy rubble falls on top of him. The units operating the mech suits should also stay mobile and surround the giant lizard, watching his limbs and tail at all times so they can detect if they notice any portion of the monster's body starting to break free. Some soldiers in the mech suit should also be able to climb up the heap of rubble up to Godzilla's face and add weight to his trap and also catch any chucks that are sliding off. The mech suit operators could have also ensured that nothing is blocking his dorsal fin and that their comrades will have a straight and clear shot to obliterate it in 20 seconds. Haruo also needs to ensure that they're not blindsided by something that they did not anticipate. He should have already noticed that Miss Fees has been acting suspicious for a long time and his true motives remain still unknown. The alien's devotion to his religion cannot be question. It is something that he never shuts up about, and something that he preaches to others throughout the 22 years that they were trapped into space together. Haruo should have leveraged this to take preventative measures against Metfis betraying them at this crucial moment and actually convince him to help out. He could have also used Metfis' religion against him. He could have babbled on about the story of the most religious awakenings and claimed that if Metfis' god can help them succeed, he will devote his life and all his soldiers will devote their lives to the religion and preach it to others, even making it the official religion of the newfound earth, which I I'm sure will be a very tempting offer that Menfees could not refuse because he knows how respected and influential Haruo is with the remaining humans. And also Menfees has to be careful. Any plans that he may have to betray the soldiers will evaporate because he will be desperate for Haruo to convert. Because if Haruo converts, he will bring in thousands more followers into the fold. So he cannot do anything that will piss off Haruo. In short folks, I think we could compel this sneaky alien to help us in any way that he can in order to ensure that Godzilla is defeated even when trapped. Godzilla is able to blast away several of the ground soldiers firing on him. The remaining soldiers continue to attack bravely. Ten seconds pass by. Then another ten pass, and Godzilla's shields go down. Haruo's team blasts apart Godzilla's dorsal fin. The monster roars in pain. Yuko and the rest of her mech suit unit spring into action. They pounce on Godzilla's back and stab EMP charges into his body. The charges burrow deep into the monster's body and detonate, causing an immense discharge of electromagnetic energy. The energy levels inside of his body spike heavily. With one final look of spite at Haruo, the giant lizard explodes in a blinding wave of blue energy. Chunks of its body fly everywhere, causing a crater of destruction around the entire mountain pass. Sometime later, the survivors, including Haruo and Yuko, slowly emerge to examine what they have done. Looking at the destruction all around them, Haruo asks Professor about the monster they just killed. He wants to know if they finally destroyed the menace that destroyed their family 
families and uprooted the lives of millions. The professor says that in his assessment, the monster they just killed isn't the exact same one who they encountered before. He speculates that this may be an offspring of the original Godzilla, who looked just like him and inherited identical abilities. He continues by saying that he's so sure that this can't be the original Godzilla, because a constantly evolving creature like him would not stay the same over tens of thousands of years. Haruo is unfazed though. He proclaims that even if there are other monsters out there, they will be able to face them, because what they just did proved that invincible monsters can be killed. Suddenly, an earthquake ripples through the ground. The crew's computer alerts them that the source of the shockwaves is nearby. Dust and debris explodes out of the mountain right in front of them. Jagged scales and fins start to rise out of the rubble. They had only killed an offspring. The true Godzilla is still alive, and he has grown to the size of a mountain. Many soldiers rush to retreat, taking off on their hover bikes in such a panic that many of their friends are left to die. Godzilla lets out a deafening roar, which unleashes a seismic blast, killing everyone in the air. He whips his tail towards the remaining soldiers, sending deadly explosions through the jungle, and Haruo is thrown back violently by the blast. As he loses consciousness, he makes a promise to kill Godzilla, and finally get his revenge. Sometime later though, the young man wakes up in a hut. A mysterious woman works nearby. She removes her masks and stares at him, giving him hope that he may have new allies in his mission against his ultimate enemy.